All right, this is Scott Hamilton with Lee Ham News. Today is October the 28th. I'm here today with J.C. Hall, who is chairman of the Pacific Northwest Aerospace Alliance, which is headquartered here in the Seattle area. The issue that we're going to be talking about today is production. Uh, Airbus and Boeing, of course, are the big two OEM uh, airframe manufacturers, and they are the principal drivers of production rates. Boeing last week on its earnings call announced a rate plan taking the Boeing 787 from 10 a month at the end of this year to 14 a month by the end of this decade. Boeing is also considering taking the 737 production rate for, uh, from 38 today, 42 next year, up to 52 by the end of the decade. Airbus has announced plans to take the A350 rate to 10 a month by 2018 and appears to have a capacity for 13 a month. It's considering whether to proceed with the second assembly line and it almost certainly would have match uh, any production rate on the 737 with its A320. Then you have the new airplanes of Bombardier, Embraer, Comac, Irkut, and Mitsubishi coming online. There are 22 new and derivative airplane models between now and 22, uh, 2022. JC, how does the supply chain plan to meet all of this demand from the airframers? Well, one of the things, Scott, is I'm not sure that the supply chain truly believes all of the production increases at this point. Uh, in the past, we've had very, shall we say, rosy forecasts from the OEMs predicting uh, things in prosperity in the business, and yet it's always turned out to be a cyclical business and uh, whether it's been uh, SARS or 9-11 or the uh, 2008 collapse in the financial world, uh, there's always been something to moderate what the OEMs have predicted. So I'm not sure that the uh, supply chain totally believes what they're being told. And that in itself is a problem because unless you believe it and make the investment up front, then it's very difficult to keep up with these rates because there's a lot of capital investment required to be able to do this. So I would say the first problem we're facing is a belief problem. Uh, then as you move beyond that, I think in general people are able to add capacity as long as, a, as it's the traditional method of building aircraft. However, there are specific areas that are going to very potentially become choke points. That, When you talk about hard metals machining, uh, certain types of metal finishing, uh, certain areas in composites, or if you're talking about uh, the larger tier ones, whether or not they're uh, capitalized for you know enough of the giant riveting machines or the giant uh, fuselage winders for H7, you know these things are all going to affect the ultimate capacity that we can handle. Well, you mentioned uh, the the cycles either economic cycles or, or SARS or what have you. And of course, in 2008 we had a prolonged uh, global financial recession, yet Airbus and Boeing were able to successfully manage their skylines. They did not cut production rates on, on the core airplanes, right. 737, 777, A320, A330. What makes you think that they would be able to successfully manage their skyline through the next cycle? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that they will. However, uh, I've heard a lot of the success on this last cycle being attributed to the ability to use the XM Bank and uh, similar mechanisms to manage the finances where it was purely a financial situation. However, there's nothing to say that that will be the case for the next unexpected item that kicks off a cycle. Um, recently when I was at the Air Transport Research uh, Forum, one of the comments was we don't know how to forecast the unexpected, that we have to expect the unexpected in this business because usually our cycle turns have been tied to something that we recognized after the fact. Yeah, the famous unknown unknowns. Is exactly. Down exactly. Yeah. 
Well, at the same time, though, both Boeing and Airbus have seven-year backlogs for the single-aisle yep. airplanes, about four-year backlogs for the twin-aisle airplanes. And uh, in the case of the 787, they're sold out until 2020, which is right. why, of course, they're going beyond 10 a month to open up <laughs> slots. Uh, Airbus has the same problem with the A350 as they're sold out to mm -hmm. about 2020. The only way to, to meet the demand is to increase production. So what is the impact of these huge, unprecedented backlogs uh, on, on the whole supply chain and production rate forecast that are being talked about? Well, I, I expect to see it really stress certain areas, like I was mentioning. Um, hard metals machining is going to be tough because lots of people can jump in and add additional machining in aluminum, uh, the traditional mainstay. But when you look at the hard metals uh, where it's used in landing gear, uh, the high lift structures and so forth, not many people do a good job of that and uh, trying to bring a lot more capacity online there is much more difficult. That's one area that I would expect that we may see a crunch uh, and you know people are trying to upgrade uh, their capacity as much as possible but you know, we're not going to know if it's enough until they run out and that's one of the problems. The, the other area that I've been personally involved with and worried about for a couple of years has been metal finishing. Uh, metal finishing is under tremendous environmental pressures. Uh, in many areas the uh, actual processing is uh, being attacked to the more restrictive uh, regulation. Um, for example, I've uh, told that next year in California they can only paint about half of the solvent-based paint uh, volume that they can this year. So all of a sudden people are going to have to look at do they have the capacity to process uh, items or do they have to take very expensive solutions to uh, address these and maintain the capacity they've got now, let alone increase it. And every day there are fewer finishers uh, that are in the aerospace industry and unless they're continuously upgrading their equipment to the latest standards, their capacity is going down. So this could be a significant problem. Uh, those are a couple of the areas I see and then and the people that I know in those areas are trying to upgrade their capacity, but there's a limit to how fast and how big uh, you can get, how much you can do within the boundaries of either capital equipment restrictions or environmental restrictions and so forth. We have about a minute left. Uh, what about just the, the whole issue of risk reward? You know, even a, a company like Spirit Aerosystems, which builds a fuselages for right. a variety of Boeing airplanes and the Airbus A350, to meet some of these production rates, undoubtedly they would have to expand their physical plants. Talk about the risk rewards here. At what point do you tip the balance? That's a really good question. Um, I know in the past, for example, that when Boeing had looked at increasing 737 rates to where they are today, they had to guarantee Spirit that they were not going to go to a composite airplane for a certain period of time because Spirit had to go invest millions of dollars in an, uh, another automated uh, riveting assembly uh, machine. Uh, I'm sure that they're going to require guarantees to, to prove out the reward side of the risk rewards question. One of the concerns for me is the little guy because as the, cons the supply chain is consolidated, a lot of the small guys are still in it, but because they've now been made second, third, fourth tier, the margin has been taken out of what they are doing. So the margin may still be there at the first or second tiers, but the small guys may not be able to see the reward to justify taking the risks and expanding the uh, equipment and the capital base. Thank you, J.C. Hall, Chairman of the Pacific Northwest Aerospace Alliance.